A 747 is flying over the Pacific when suddenly a cargo door explodes. Nine passengers are sucked out of the plane. It went from a perfectly normal, calm, serene situation to absolute pandemonium. Another 747, another terrifying incident. As for 32 minutes, pilots struggle in vain to control the plane. They faced a condition that no pilot can possibly imagine, which is the airplane's no longer controllable. A 737 loses a giant chunk of fuselage mid-flight, causing a decompression so powerful it kills a flight attendant. I saw what I think was the stewardess's feet as she was being sucked out of the plane. A DC-10 loses an engine on takeoff, causing the plane to roll on its side and nosedive to the ground. The entire engine had physically separated from the aircraft. All these disasters have one thing in common. The physical structure of each plane failed with fatal consequences. What pushed these planes to the breaking point? Whenever a plane goes down, it's usually images of the tragic aftermath that are seen around the globe. Scattered wreckage, tattered clues as to what may have happened. But using dramatic animations, we can take a close-up look at these incidents and even place ourselves inside the planes, right next to passengers experiencing unimaginable terror. These are the stories of what happens when jets fail. Structural failures when part of the airplane itself fails. In the worst case, it could be something like a wing actually coming off the airplane, or a tail section, or an engine, or a cargo door. Well, the structure of the airplane is like the bones in your body, and it holds everything together. If the airplane's structure is the skeleton, then the mechanical parts inside are the internal organs. The hydraulic system provides a plane's muscle, the electrical system its brain, and the pneumatic system the breath. All these systems must be in working order for a plane to fly properly. Structural and mechanical failures can often be traced back to problems with the way planes are maintained or inspected. One example is the case of a 737 which lost part of its fuselage in mid-air on the 28th of April 1988. At 1.30 p.m., Aloha Airlines Flight 243 takes off on its seventh inter-island hop of the day. The flight from Hilo to Honolulu should last just 35 minutes. But this 19-year-old Boeing 737 has a major problem. Growing cracks in its skin that are visible, yet they've gone undetected. Patricia Aubrey is sitting in row 17. We took off. Everything was normal. I always read a book when I'm flying. To fully understand what's about to happen to Aloha Flight 243, it's critical to know what an airplane goes through every time it flies. Think of the plane's fuselage as a balloon. Every time it goes up, the outside of the plane or the skin expands. That's from the cabin being pressurized so people can breathe at high altitudes where the air is thin. Then, when the plane comes down, the skin contracts. Every takeoff and landing, no matter how long or short the trip, is considered one cycle. And each cycle puts stress on an airplane, potentially causing microscopic cracks. So you have this constant pressure cycle where it expands, contracts, expands, and contracts. Over a period of time, the metal will eventually start to fatigue because of all of this expansion and contraction, just like a balloon. As the 737 climbs through 24,000 feet, the cabin pressurizes and the skin of the plane expands just as it's supposed to. But something else expands too, those cracks in the 737's fuselage. Suddenly, there's an explosive decompression. Its force is so powerful, a flight attendant is sucked out of the plane. I saw 
what I think was the stewardess's feet as she was being sucked out of the plane. Magazines, briefcases, shoes, you name it, anything that wasn't tied down was going out that hole. An 18-foot section of the plane is gone. Passengers sitting nearby can see the sky above and the ocean below. All that's holding the 737 together are the floor beams and the plane's belly structure. About two rows in front of me, I could see the floor was buckling up. The plane was bending in the middle. You can't just have a very strong piece of the bottom of the airplane without having a strong piece of the top. And so when they lost that crown, it really compromised the structural integrity. The cockpit would move in one direction, and then finally the fuselage would, would actually bend and then follow it. So it wasn't as though it was a single piece. It actually was bending. They knew they needed on the ground. Hello, 243, can you give me your souls on board and your fuel on board? We are 85, 86 plus 5 crew members. Roger, how many do you think are injured? We have no idea. We can communicate with our flight attendants. Okay, we'll have ambulance on the way. Miraculously, the pilots managed to land the plane. These images of Aloha Flight 243 stun people around the globe. It doesn't seem to make any difference how many times we've seen it today. It is still amazing. An airliner with its fuselage ripped away in midair, and all but one aboard survived. It happened over Hawaii. There were no bomb explosions. They just pooped like a balloon, but it exploded and the top came off. I saw that the plane was falling apart up in the front. I thought we were done. Earlier that year, the U.S. Federal Aviation Authority had issued a routine maintenance alert for airlines to detect and repair cracks. Aloha had not yet performed those inspections on its fleet. When a passenger reports after the accident that she had seen a crack near the cabin door as she boarded the plane, it doesn't take long for investigators to work out what's happened to the 737. It's a combination of hot and humid weather and constant takeoffs and landings. Unlike long haul flights where you take off at JFK and you fly eight hours and you land in London, that's one cycle in an eight hour period. On these island hoppers, you could fly for two hours and have 20 cycles, up and down, up and down, 30 minute cycles where you pressurize the airplane, take off, fly for 15 minutes, land, then pressurize the airplane again, so the accumulative effect of the cycling of the fuselage is greater in a short period of time than on a long haul flight where you have one pressurization cycle in an eight hour period. That was what was really not understood until this particular accident. Aloha 243 was a case where the industry began to learn the corrosive nature and how carefully it had to be monitored in a marine environment because the airplane had spent decades in and out of the Hawaiian Islands. The corrosion had expanded and it, with it, cracks. The cracks began to propagate and move, and they finally failed. The results were absolutely catastrophic. Coming up, the deadliest plane crash in the history of U.S. aviation, as a five-ton engine violently rips away from a DC-10 on takeoff. The pilots knew they had a very serious problem. They knew the engine had failed, but they didn't know that it had actually come off the airplane. And a night flight over the Pacific goes treacherously wrong. In one second, the fellow passengers were sitting there with magazines and drinks, and then a nanosecond later, they were gone. Aeroplane failures, whether structural or mechanical, can often be traced back to the way planes are maintained or inspected. A tragic case in point, American Airlines Flight 191 the deadliest single aeroplane crash on U.S. soil. May the 25th, 1979, the Friday of Memorial Day weekend. American Flight 191, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, is on its way to Los Angeles with 258 passengers and 13 crew members on board. Melody Smith and Kim Jockel's parents are on the first leg of a trip to Hawaii. 
her story was... My mom and dad always had a big kickoff for summer, and so we normally would have been with them. However, they had decided about six months before that they were going to Hawaii. A few minutes before 3 p.m., the plane is cleared to taxi to runway 32 right. At 3.02 p.m., it's cleared for takeoff. Our investigative animations are about to turn you into an eyewitness to a horrific accident. The flight crew, Flight 191, starts their normal takeoff roll. As the airplane departs the runway on their normal climb out, they get an indication that they've got an engine failure. One of the DC-10's wing-mounted engines has ripped away from the plane, flying up and over the left wing. Gone with it are hydraulics and pneumatics, systems critical to controlling the airplane. The pilots knew they had a very serious problem. They knew the engine had failed, but they didn't know that it had actually come off the airplane. There's no indication for that. Look at this, look at this. Blew up an engine, equipment, need equipment, blew an engine. Oh. The, the leading edge slats, which give the wing better lift at slow speeds during takeoff and landing, are controlled hydraulically. Now, with no hydraulic power on the left side, the left slats retract back into the wing. Which means now he has less lift on that side than he has on the opposite side, so the airplane wants to roll. An eyewitness manages to snap a photo of American Airlines 191 rolled onto its side with its left wing pointing straight down to the ground. What happens next seals the fate of Flight 191. Pilots are trained to handle engine failures and they did what their training taught them to do. They reduced their airspeed. But when they did that, they no longer had airflow across the flight controls. They did a, a, a very good job of trying to get control of the airplane, but they just didn't have enough altitude or enough time to, to do it. The plane staggers up to 325 feet. As it's rolled onto its side and now slowed down, it is uncontrollable and goes into a nosedive. Within 31 seconds of the engine severing from the plane, the DC-10 slams into a trailer park less than a mile from the runway. The entire flight has lasted just two minutes, but it's changed these sisters' lives forever. I can remember, still remember you saying, there's no other way to tell you that there's been a really bad accident. Yeah, and mom and dad are, are dead. dead. And, I, and I said, you need to find a way to come home. There was no noise at all, and the plane just uh, it went left wing tip right into the ground, and as soon as it hit, it had a napalm effect. It just Everything in its path was just blown into a sheet of flame. Initially, investigators are baffled. What could have caused a structural failure of this magnitude? This is all that was left of American Airlines Flight 191, as far as it got on its way to Los Angeles. They sift through the wreckage and look to the plane's two flight recorders for clues. Within days of the crash, they begin to zero in on a part called the pylon. It has a 13-inch crack they believe was caused by fatigue prior to the crash, which maintenance inspections had missed. At Evergreen International, an airplane maintenance and storage facility outside Tucson, Arizona, aviation consultant John Cox explains. You can see up here the pylon assembly in which the engine rests on the pylon and then is attached to the wing. It looks like an arm that's out there, hang the engine's hanging off it. That is a very complicated piece of structure. It has to be designed to take a heck of a load for the engines. Investigators also scrutinize the plane's service history, and that's when the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. It turns out not to be a design flaw. It's a troubling maintenance practice. The whole issue of that accident centered on the maintenance practice of changing an engine with this pylon attached as opposed to the more correct and approved procedure to take the engine away from the pylon while it was still attached to the airplane. To change an engine on the DC-10, the manufacturer recommended detaching the engine from the pylon, but leaving the pylon attached to the wing. At the time, engineers from several airlines were using a shortcut they found if the engine and pylon assembly were removed in one piece, they could change an engine a lot more quickly. They would just drop 
the, the entire unit from the wing, change the component, put it all back together. In theory, it sounded great. On paper, it looked good. It's when maintenance workers are reattaching the engine and pylon eight weeks before the crash, the fatal mistake is made. If the airline had followed manufacturer requirements, workers would have simply reattached the engine to the